What's up, Docs and Docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here. And once again, I am joined by Golden Age Cartoons alum and curator Matt Hunter. And once again, 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 once again, anyway, we're talking once again about the redrawn and colorized, should be drawn and quarterized, no, drawn and quartered, yes, drawn and quartered, right, Matt? No? Jeez, wow, dude, you're a great crowd. <laughs> well, go on. And yeah, no, seriously, thanks for leaving me hanging. Yeah, so last week, <laughs> we talked about these bastardized black and whites, as I like to call them, and uh, specifically, we talked about the history of Fred Ladd's color systems, which was responsible for the redraws, some of our personal stories growing up and seeing these on TV, and all throughout these discussions, I kept trying to get to a quote about these uh, old cartoons from Tom Minton, who... Um, if you don't know who he is, he was a storyboard artist, writer, producer on many shows in the 80s and 90s that fans of Looney Tunes growing up then would have seen. Tiny Toon Adventures, he was the inspiration for Brain of Pinky and the Brain, which he also wrote for on Animaniacs. Uh, he was on the ground floor of the now iconic Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures, headed up then by the animation legend Ralph Bakshi. Uh, step in any time, Matt, help me out. <laughs> Uh, he was also the uh, the main writer for Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries. Yeah, well, he had writing duties, but uh, he was the head of the show in that he was the producer of the show. Uh, he was essentially in charge of that show and now retired. He started in the business when the redraws were still being made. So anyway, I had a quote about, uh, f about the redraws from him last week, and we never got to it. So I'm going to start by reading that now. Uh, this is his response to me asking if he knew anything about either the computer colorized versions or the redraws, and here's what he had to say. All I know is what I gleaned talking to old timers. Virtually everyone who was an artist, writer, producer, or even a cell painter was offended by the crappy workmanship on full display in those late 60s overseas repainted cartoons. And Bob Clampett's rep seemed to suffer the most, since the majority of the repainted, the repainted shorts were originally directed by him, and the terrible redos still bore his name. I was told that the deal was made by suits at Warner Brothers who were impressed by the first one or two repainted cartoons that the overseas shop showed them. It later became painfully apparent that more time and care had been spent on the first one or two in order to land the job of doing a million more. And that, and that no executive making that deal was an artist and no artists, especially none who'd worked on the original black and white shorts, were ever consulted prior to the contract being signed. American business at its nakedest, conned by one of their own bait-and-switch cons, and bitten in the ass in the end. The overseas studio were still using the same trick as late as the previous decade. I'm sorry, let me say that again. The overseas studios were still using the same trick as late as the previous decade, doing a great job on the audition footage, often using a superior crew than would the actual stuff once the contract was signed. The studios seldom learn. Well, I it was it was in 1967, and Warner Brothers had gone through uh, basically a, two major corporate mergers over the period of two years, uh, or, or three years really. And it was because the Seven Arts Company bought out Warner Brothers. Uh, Jack Warner sold out essentially. Yeah. Uh, he was getting old, and he wanted out, and he just sold it to this company and merged, and they turned into Warner Brothers Seven Arts, and. Um, what they did was they decided to put these cartoons in color uh, for TV, and that, that's why they made the redrawns. And then they they stopped subcontracting to the the real artists, like now, uh, you know, the Patty Freeling. We should uh, we should also address. I think we should address a, a little bit because this is kind of relevant now today too. There's there's a feeling of anything that's black and white is old fashioned and therefore not worthy of, of one's time. And it even ex extends as far as things, you know, like there's people that haven't seen, and these two movies, by the way, could not be more opposite of each other, but there are or these three, I would say these, there are people who have not seen, um, clerks, Schindler's list or Eraserhead simply because they're black and white and these are modern movies and yeah there's certainly something that 
you know these colorized versions on that level that they're responding to which is we need these we're playing these during other cartoons that are in color and other shows that are more modern in color and there's this weird stigma about black and white being old and therefore unhip and it's like well yeah but when you try to hippify something that wasn't it's kind of like watching the three stooges movie <laughs> yeah yeah like, something's just not right because the black and white was an art form in yeah. and of itself by the way i forgot to show this to matt earlier but this adams family meme does more to show how black and white is an art form right down to how certain colors photograph in grayscale by the power of grayscale it can look spooky in black and white when irl it's really pink and peach isn't that right static wow that static is really dancing now that it's pink. Dancing is forbidden. The people who know how color works, the people who know what, you know, the natural path that the eye takes in any given point. You know, you're going to know where the you, you know what draws the eye to certain things. These are artists and they yeah. know they they can be, you know, they can be more more masterful about it than we can even speak about it. You know. Yeah. And yet yeah. and yet it's just well, yeah, but let's just, that's true, but just make them color, okay? Yeah. Well, we can't. Yeah. We'll do it. But we can't. Yeah, but do it. Yeah, but do how, it anyway. <laughs> how about you take the money that you would spend on it and make new cartoons if you want new shit? Yeah. If you want well, that so Well, the thing bad. is, they, they did, and what they well, should have yeah. done is put an actual budget to the cartoons that they made at the time. Mm -hmm. Because what they did was they were trying to cheap out when they subcontracted to uh, DePatty Freeling. Uh, and then when Seven Arts took over, they said, no, let's do them in-house again, but let's do them cheaper than any Hanna-Barbera crap you could see <laughs> on Saturday morning. And that's how you got Cool Cat, Merlin the Mouse, uh, Bunny and Claude, and all that stuff. A lot of studios did it, like the, uh, you know, whoever owned Betty Boop at the time. No, that's did. that's Color Systems, too. That is the same company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, Popeye later yep. in the 80s when Turner had them done. They did. Those are bad. I, I actually have the numbers, and it was partnered with uh, Elliot Hyman, which is a great name, by the way, for somebody who fucked these cartoons. <laughs> um, yeah. begin, uh, so there were 78 Porkies, uh, 100 Betty Boops, 18 Crazy Cats, and there was a test of Farmer Alfalfa, uh, and then there were some Mutt and Jeff cartoons, uh, Felix, a few Box Bosco and Buddy titles, but um, but the, yeah, those are those are most of the numbers. Wow, I'm losing these uh, these 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 cartoons over here because I'm getting all technicu. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, they're they uh, they didn't just ruin Warner Brothers, folks. <laughs> they uh, yeah. Well, uh, we were going to talk about how these these colorized versions have these people who are obsessed with them, and and they just post on the internet all the time about like the weirdness of them, and they they analyze every frame of these redrawns, and they're like obsessed with the you know with the different tack ons. Like every time they change the title cards for these things, it's like yeah, well there's the original, and then there's the seven arts version, and then there's the eighties version, and then there's the public domain tape version. Who it's cares? Like, it's like okay, I you could you, here's your choices. You can have the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa after I wiped my ass with it. <laughs> or the Mona Lisa after we threw feces at it from afar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who would pick any of the other options? The Mona Lisa. Yeah. Give me that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we it has to compete with all the other shit on Saturday morning TV, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that's an apt metaphor, if I do say something. I'm biased. Granted, I'm biased, but I do think it's an apt metaphor. Yeah. Or you know, let's let's uh, you know let's let's piss on the Mona Lisa, and then let's put a, a funky title card over each end of it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I understand. I mean, you know, I'm not one of the the, the people uh, who who complains about the title cards, but I do. It is an an ad an insult to injury when the, even they get it's like if you're re, if you're redoing the whole cartoon, why not get the right title cards? But of course, as Tom mentioned um, in his quote, uh, it's these uh, people didn't care. It's an overseas job, 
and very much, you know, Tom has a long history of, um, you know, when he was uh, the producer of Sylvester and Tweety uh, Mysteries, um, and on other shows too, has you know long history of, of dealing with uh, with uh, overseas house uh, mistake corrections and and stuff like that, and and you know that's basically what he was saying. There's your uh, your your uh, your TV title up there for the recolor, right? Yeah, yeah. See what they did with that is. The uh, Warner Brothers sent these over to South Korea, and they sent kind of whatever print they had lying on the shelf. And since they had just reacquired these from, uh, you know, having sold them off for so many years, uh, Sunset slash Guild uh, removed any reference to Warner Brothers oh, from really? any of the cartoons. So, like, um, for, ex- for example, when they were showing them in black and white, uh, Porky and Wacky Land, that scene where the dodo bird yeah. zooms in on the, on the WB shield and hits Porky with a slingshot, they cut that out. Look at how <laughs> even, even this, this dog character can't stand the re... <laughs> the the yeah. recolor. He's pay you. Yeah, that that Good dog riddance. and that cat in particular. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Disney would never do this. Uh, <laughs> Disney did some computer colorized around the same time really? that uh, Warner Brothers was doing the uh, <clears throat> the stuff with Nickelodeon. The computer color on the middle here. Really, uh, there were some computer colorized Mickey's, and they. It, they they were kind of brown looking if I remember right they didn't look right uh, and th- you don't see them anymore like they they it was it was kind of like in the early 90s when computer colorization came out there was kind of a trend where everybody wanted to do it like Ted Turner yeah um, and um, you know Ted Turner colorized Casablanca in computer colorized form which is just sacrilege you know what it is and and here's what I can say Matt. You are located in Fort Worth, so you really can't yeah. you can't help me on this. But I'm in that rare position. I am a drive, a a short drive away from Turner. I live in Georgia. I live in Atlanta. Um, so um, I think I'm going to hop on the car right now and uh, and give that and give old Turner a, a piece of my mind. That's what I'm going to do. God, I'm back. Ted's home. He finally really did it. You maniacs! The black and white! You screwed them up! How dare you! God damn you all the hell! Yes, girl, up. That's gonna have to do.